And so we come to our last uh, talk in the present series. It's been a delightful time. And Sister Bernice and I have been greatly blessed and helped. What a remarkable man this man Jeremiah was. He was a priest, he came from Anathoth. And he's going to inherit that in the kingdom of God, God has told him. When we read these prophets, it's interesting to notice that they're not just making prophecies in the sense of foretelling things. They're actually in charge of the prophecy. You know, in that verse, uh, and I, I never cease to marvel over this, the, um, the tenth verse, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And that was exactly what it was. The word in Jeremiah's mouth, as soon as it was uttered, went out to perform this work. Some would be done right away, some would take a little time, some would be stained with tears when he sees his beloved Jerusalem at the end in ruin and total wreck and all the daughters of Zion all just there destroyed in the city. This word of God. And we've had our time together just looking at this word of God. And because we're living in a similar time, that word that was spoken so long ago is still at work and just as powerful. The word of the Lord or the word of the prophets, whether it's Ezekiel or Joel or Hosea, wherever we go, those words are still active. There isn't a word of God that goes out of his mouth that is inert. It will accomplish what he intends it to do. So powerful. The 25th of chapter of Ezekiel is exactly the same, where Ezekiel is given power over the nations. So this is the word of God, and no one can resist it, and God's purpose will be fulfilled. What we're here for this evening is to bid farewell to ourselves as we uh, come to our time of separation. Some have already gone on the way, and let's hope they have arrived safely in the places to which they are travelling. Others will go later. And the cry tonight is to awaken. So maybe you'd like to join me in Ephesians and chapter 5. We've been in this chapter several times over the uh, last few days. Partly because of the way the chapter begins. Hanging on to the last words of the preceding chapter. Then all the things to do with marriage and so on. And then we come across a, a verse that seems to hang in space. Verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It, it looks as though it's a quotation. There is no place where it comes from as a, as a, as a total quote. You can find echoes of it here and there in, a, in Isaiah and so on. But, uh, and it's, it's interesting because um, at the beginning it says, Wherefore he saith, and you see, there's no he really there. That, that's that, that's um, in italics, so there's nothing there behind it. It's a strange kind of expression. It occurs earlier on in, in Ephesians as well. It saith, he saith. And these words are then directed to us. Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. So this verse assumes that the readers are asleep. It's personal. Have you noticed that it's, we've been following pronouns during this time we've had together. It's, 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 it's thou that sleepest. I know that other versions spoil it by having to say you, and which means they can't distinguish between whether it's one or many. That was the old thee and thou and ye and so on helped you, you to distinguish between one or many 
the, the, the kind of omnibus word you doesn't, doesn't help in that regard. This is directed just to the person, as though it's to me. Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. that is in the setting of all kinds of darkness in the, the preceding verses all sorts of things for example in verse 11 and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret so the times of Paul were like our time darkness is falling and tonight in Durban and we've been going on during the day but tonight then everybody that goes into these dark recesses to do works of darkness will begin their work that will go on throughout the night and you and I are told to have no fellowship with those works and to be separate people not to be identified with them not to be companions with them not be able to recite all the people who are the stars of many movies or videos or programs of television and not know the names of the Bible as well. What we're told to do is to separate ourselves. Now, I want to be practical and, and try to help in this matter because how do you do it? Awake thou that sleepest, you, you can't wake yourself up, can you? I mean, you might disturb yourself by a dream or because you fall out of bed. But in actual fact, it requires somebody else. Now, there's an astonishing verse in the Old Testament, and, and the nature of it didn't dawn on me for quite a long time. Just come to Psalm 97. Psalm 97. This cluster of psalms, these 90s, are kingdom psalms. The kingdom's actually there, although at the same time, the actual psalm is moving towards the kingdom. God is king. That's what it says at the beginning of this very psalm. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. And then there are all kinds of expressions running through the psalm. Until, as we come towards the end of the psalm, and you know the verse very well, you'd have read it time and time again. The astonishing nature of what's being said doesn't dawn right away. And so we'll just have a look at uh, verse 11. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. How do you sow light? That's what it says, isn't it? Light is sown for the upright or for the righteous anything you sow is something that's got to bring forth fruit I mean the beauty of flowers and shrubs and trees is that their roots are in darkness and they are encouraged to come to the light to reach for it but that's where it all takes place in the darkness and so light has to be sown how do we do it? Well, there are brethren who carry around bags of darkness. You know, they turn up at the business meeting because they, they want to say something that's disturbing in some way. You know, they open the bag and let the darkness out. Bring them along, you know, any conversation, they've always have a kind of acid note. You know, or, or not just pessimistic, it's more than that. It's destructive of, of, of faith and uh, optimism. Now, if you're one of those people, because it happens in marriages, there are husbands who do, do this and, and wives who do it. Who make the home so miserable that, uh, you know, I've just cleaned it, don't walk on it, you know. So, the house is uh, it's not a place to walk on, it's a place to look at and be careful about. Now, mind your fingers on that, be careful. In other words, life is always, there's always a kind of sourness about it, a kind of threat that is there 
or husbands who come in with a face that looks like doom, you know, home from work. Mm. I've had a day today. Well, so has she, but uh, the fact is, his is hanging so heavy on his mouth he can't turn it up at the sides, except by standing on his head, which is about what is the best thing you could do, I suppose. But, you know, here, here are these people coming home, you know, want my feet up, don't trouble me, and mother's going around saying, don't trouble father. No, he's very sensitive at the moment, you know. And mother reads it and thinks, oh, poor dad, he's fragile again. And uh, then finally, you know, when it comes to the time when he might do a little bit of work with the, with the washing up or other things, although I know that's not a great custom in uh, too many homes. I I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and I wasn't really thinking of you, Brother Chairman, but, um, but the, the fact is, it's, you know, the, the best way to bring light is to get going. That's the great. That's the great thing. Get into it. Do it, and and uh, so that with the, you, what you do, uh, three more like that, and we're out. Um, <laughs> that's uh, seventy-two we've had during the week, you know. So, so here we go. <laughs> yes, I count them. I observe them. See who it is who does it, and how. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about it is, you know. In most of these these coughs and things, have you noticed the folks haven't got a handkerchief or anything? They just go. <laughs> I I do it at home occasionally. I say, oh, that was great. <laughs> uh, 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 th thanks for your sneeze. It's cheered me up no end. It's, uh, it's it's great. But but there is something about it. It shakes everything that you know, oh, goes right through, and oh, it's wonderful. All right. Well, now, let's just get back to this matter of, of, of light being sown. Because, obviously, what we're being told is there a, there's a process. It's not, not just putting the switch on. It's not light at all. It's not the security light that comes on just because you approach it to within a certain distance. This has got to be sown. It's got to go, strangely enough, into darkness to do its work. This light. You will have remembered, I am sure, though I know some of you find that the things of the tabernacle and so on too complicated to, uh, to hang on to. The tabernacle is not complicated, it is simple. That's what it's intended to be, so that we can, we can just understand what's happening. There's only one door. And that, that it couldn't be more simple, could it? If you lived on the other side, it was very inconvenient. You had to come all the way around to go in. But there's only one door. That's all just one place and it looks as though you're being kept out as a matter of fact because right round the tabernacle are all the tents of the Levites and then at the door there's the tent of Moses and the tent of Aaron and, and then there's a great altar as soon as you enter blocking your way as it were and you can go no further unless you happen to be a Levite and then you can only go a certain distance and then the, the priest is allowed to go and he only goes a certain distance as far as the veil is concerned he can't go any further and the high priest goes once a year beyond that but there is a way and when you read the psalmist when he speaks of it he says I'm in the, I'm in the most holy place you just follow the words of David and he wasn't a priest except in a kind of token really of being a Melchizedek priesthood just just like that for David that's how it was when he brought the tabernacle into Jerusalem but the fact is David said I've washed my hands in innocency I've laboured my hands now he got no right to go anywhere near the labour he couldn't do that when Psalm 91 is written then this is somebody who's dwelling under the shadow of the almighty he's with the cherubim right in the most holy place in other words, what was pictured there was not to keep us out, but to invite us in. So that we could, we could, we, we could then perceive what it was all about. But we haven't got to go far. When it goes through into, the, into this first part of the tent, there are two parts. There's the most holy and this part. When you have, go into this part, what you discover is that there is light. Uh, and it's being beautifully reflected all around because the walls are all of gold and so what you see here you can see there and it's reflected everywhere 
When you have a look to see where it comes from, you see it's a perfection of lamps. There are seven lamps on the candlestick. When you have a look at the candlestick, you discover that it's a, that it's a tree. You have a look at the description of the candlestick. It's got, it's, it's got the main trunk, it's got the branches, and in the branches are all the signs, all the signs of growth. All the way up until you come to the end when it's in flower, that's where the light is. And it's an almond tree, that's the other thing. The very thing we read about in Jeremiah chapter 1. It's a tree, a living thing. It's been sown, and now it's bearing, bearing fruit. What? It wasn't seen by everybody, but those who heard about it, and those who worked on it, it was made out of one piece of metal. It was turned, it was marvellous work, all of it, until finally there it was, all ready. But the people who worked on it, all the Bezaleels and the Aholiabs and uh, all the men and women who were doing parts of the tabernacle. It was busy all over the camp. It was in no time. They got the, they got the tabernacle erected by the first day of the first month of their second year of coming out of Egypt. How they managed to do all that work, you know, well, they couldn't have done it if it hadn't been just under the guidance of God. And so in different places, there were different people doing various things. And the wonder of what was taking place was a real marvel because it was sown in darkness, you see. So here, here what we've got is the candlestick. Or if we go through to the cherubim, once again, all, all of one piece. There are no joints in it at all. The whole thing is one. And then you say to yourself, uh, where did that gold come from then? It came out of the nose rings of the Egyptian girls from the anklets that they wore and the bracelets. It came out of dark Egypt like you, like me, out of dark Egypt. And God makes it holy. And to that which just graces the necks and anklets and wrists of pretty girls was now within the most holy place with the glory of God now it couldn't be a simpler lesson could it it could not be simpler we are from Egypt and God's taking us to the most holy place in the end by his love that has the dimensions of the most holy place equal in length and breadth and height just like the city of God in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. Light was sown. And it was sown there in that place of God to be a perpetual light. That it might be like, well is it God that's shining? Or is it Israel who is shining? Or does it represent all the saints of God? And so one can think, you know, in stages. Climbing the rungs of a ladder as thoughts get higher. And we are people who are going to be part of the final candlestick of God. When he fills the earth with his glory. The almond tree is the tree of resurrection, you see. That's what Jeremiah was told. What do you see? He said, I see an almond tree. And God said, you've well seen. And the word there for the almond tree is shaked. And then God says, I will watch over this. I will hasten the word. Like the almond tree that races to be the first in blossom in the spring. And God uses a word there that's just, a, just as a, nearly like the word for Amon. He says, you've seen well in seeing, seeing the showcared, and I will shake it, I will hasten it. And so the Amon tree was, was the, the forerunner of things. And what is more, it was a tree of resurrection because 
It was that that happened to Aaron's rod, was it not? It was an almond rod. Whether it was when it was put in there is another matter, but when it came out, that's what it was. And it had got everything at the same time. It had got the buds and the flowers and the almonds all at the same time, just by the wonder of God. Now, so you and I then, brethren and sisters, are really to be light bearers. Now, this little expression here in Psalm 97, and this thought from the tabernacle, is taken up back to Ephesians chapter 5, and just have a look. I think the, the NIV probably makes this clear. But here, is, here we are now told that there are children of disobedience in Ephesians 5 verse 6. In verse 7 it says, Be not ye that partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. You came out of Egypt, the land of darkness, and now you have light in your dwellings. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit, and you see in the NIV and in the Revised Version, it says the fruit of light. It's been sown. It's the fruit of light. So what's in Psalm 97 as sown finally produces fruit. And there it is. In all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So now we need to know whether when we go back to work tomorrow, or to school, or to college, when we go back, whether we're going to, wherever we're going to work, are we going to take the lamp of the Lord with us, or not? Or are we going to go, go with our bags of darkness like everybody else? There'll be folks there who've got headaches that they can't get over for about a month because of, of the time they spent during the holidays. One almighty binge. And so they'll, they'll be complaining. At work I was, I, I was regarded as the Monday menace because I was always happy. And other people were miserable on Mondays because that's why the excuse begins with an M, I suppose. And so, you know, that's, that was Monday to them. And here's Harry, all bright, and they ask me, what have you been doing? And then you tell them exactly what you've been doing. You know, at a fraternal gathering, we've been to the meeting, we've been with young people, and they do not understand where the light's coming from. The, 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 the glare is too bright for them. As you know, they used to call me at work, the bishop. That, that was, that was my, my nickname. One of the nicknames I had. <laughs> and, uh, but they're all enjoyable. But I still meet these people, you know. It's very interesting because uh, my deputy, uh, his wife had had a mastectomy quite a long time ago. And then about, about 20 years later, the thing flared up again and she died. So we went to the funeral in the village. And there, there was everything done decently and in order as, as they would do it. The flag of St. George was flying over the church. And when uh, we came out of the church, a member of my staff from elsewhere came to me and said, uh, Harry, what do you think of it? I said, what? He said, what was said there? Now, I didn't like to say anything because in actual fact, and this was, this was very poor, he said nothing about the dead person. About you know, normally they, they they have a eulogy about the past, but nothing like that at all. And there was no note of hope. There was nothing. It was everything all oh, sweet music and so on, and that was it. Then he said to me, "What do you believe?" So, well, that was the golden opportunity to say say what our belief was. Some months later, we went and stayed with them. And they came to the meeting with us, you know, because they felt, uh, and of course there is nothing like a Christadelphian funeral. I think it's the most wonderful occasion. I don't mean, but, you know, some people regard it as the opportunity to preach at people who happen to be there who are not Christadelphians. 
It's not that. You don't have to preach at people at all. The whole thing is preaching, isn't it? We have such confidence at a funeral and such joy and we've got such clarity about what's happened and what will happen that we're, we're so different from everybody else. N none of this vague mistiness, you know, that there is absolutely clear. Uh, and that, that's why I suppose it is that um, uh, I'm not sure what the practice is here. I'm not condemning either practice. Uh, whether cremation is, is more, uh, I was going to say, popular um, than, than burial. For me, I, I, I would want, not now, but what I would want is to be, is to be buried. All right. No, not because resurrection can't take place if you've been burned. Of course, it, of course it can, or you've been eaten by fish, or whatever it is if you're drowned at sea. But there is something about the act of the burial that helps just to say something, and to be able to say at the funeral that this person will be raised from the dead, and of you know this is light being sown it seems to go into darkness but it is light being sown you'll see that in a moment that, uh, that there's a, a, a beautiful section of scripture on this so they didn't continue their interest those people but at least they haven't done so far they write to us about once a year and uh, but one day maybe just a little word and uh, because they do know and they know that we're different and it doesn't mean that we're eccentrically different we are different we're positive we've got a hope we know this is not boasting we know I know that my Redeemer liveth brother in our Ecclesia 93 died just a, just a few weeks ago he used to sit there he, he was wonderful this brother of 93 he was an, he was an artist and uh, he, he, look, he looked a little like um, Colonel Sanders in the, um, uh, you know, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, advertisement. That's how his face was with his, with his special beard and so on. And he'd sit there and he would look and, uh, and I'd talk to him sometimes and say, no, just recite. And out of the archives of his memory, he could recite and on and on and on and on the most complicated Anybody who uh, uh, has read some of the, the, um, of the poems which have got stress in certain places and are difficult to read, he was able to recite these things. But I loved to see him when he was sitting down on the edge of the settee and he had, he had a, a forefinger that did strange things, you see, and he would say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he did it with such emphasis that uh, he was sure that he was right. I know that my Redeemer liveth. What a wonderful thing. That light has been sown in my darkness and my Redeemer lives. So this chapter is leading us to that. Come now to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26. And I'm going to keep you awake, even though it's, you know, towards the end of the week, and you know how it is. And you've been listening, listening to words, 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 and you remember next to none of them. You just remember one or two little phrases here and there that, that are precious to you. In this chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 26, there are all kinds of wonderful things. You can see this at the beginning because there is the city of salvation, as it were, that is being described here. In that day, and you say, what day is that? It's the day when verse 9 of the preceding chapter takes place. And it should be said in that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and we will be glad, he will save us. This is the Lord, and we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Perfect, beautiful picture here now. All right. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. 
whose mind is stayed on thee. Perfect peace is shalom, shalom. It's just a double shalom. That's all it is. Eh? Then we have the name of God, and, and here it's, uh, it, it's quite interesting because it, it, it isn't Yahweh, Yahweh, it is Yah. Just, just the first word is just that shortened version, as in hallelujah. All right, that's what it is. And, and the second is, uh, is, is the word Yahweh. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So that's the opening of the chapter. This is when Isaiah, and he has these periodic as he goes through the book. Uh, and, and the interesting thing, as he writes from time to time, by the Spirit, it, the Spirit allows him a certain latitude. You know, because we think of, of Isaiah writing for God, just like Jeremiah was told to speak, you'll speak what I tell you, Jeremiah. Then God allows Isaiah, and you'll find it in several places, to have a little word. To say something. Well, have a look in this... Uh, it, 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 again, just follow the, the pronouns here uh, we've been doing it earlier. Look at verse nine, eight. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The de desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee. This is, now, this is God now allowing, inspiring Isaiah to write his own faith. He was talking about everybody else, and now he says, this is me, Lord. This is exactly what God wants to hear from us, isn't it? Not just our collective praise, but our individual praise, our expressions of total conviction about what he's done is right. And there he says, Yea, with my spirit within me, I will seek thee early. All right? Diligently. And then he adds, as though you can see the thunderclouds. And he says, For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Verse 11, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see. Yea, and be ashamed for their envy at the people, and so on as he goes on. And then he comes to the end of this little place. And this may be just where the Spirit picked up some of the words in Ephesians chapter 5. Here we, here we are. Verse 19. Now just follow the pronouns again because they're going to do strange things. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body and that can be both singular and plural that word strangely enough shall they arise so there are people who are called thy dead men they're still his right thy dead men if you want to identify them you can do that keep your finger here in Isaiah and come to Zechariah chapter 9 just just keep your finger there and come to Zechariah. This, this, this exercise is, is very worthwhile now. Just, just see. Because you want to be a good, one of God's dead men if you're going to die, be, belong to God. So here in Zechariah chapter 9, where Messiah himself now makes his appearance, his first and second coming are both in this very chapter. Because in verse 9 we have the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 10, And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow should be cut off. This is yet to be done. That wasn't done at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, End of verse uh, 10, And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, even to the river even to the ends of the earth follow the pronoun as for thee also so you say who, who, who's been spoken to then 
Is the the in verse 11 a person different from the he in the preceding verse? These are great exercises. Brethren, when you do your daily readings, follow the pronouns. They do wonderful things. You come to the conclusion that um, when you read this, that the the here is Christ himself. Just look what it says. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, this is exactly what he said at the Last Supper, isn't it? All right. I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein there is no water. Now, there are people, therefore, who are trapped in a prison with no water, and the man of the blood of the covenant is their deliverer. Now, we all understand that, and who it is, and that we were the people in the pit. We were in the prison with no water, until the living water came to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is making that plain here. Christ fulfilled verse 9 within a, a, just a few days of his then fulfilling verse 11. Because that was a Passover psalm that was involved in verse 9. As you can see by going to Psalm 118. Now, when you come towards the end of the chapter you now see wonderful things uh, sorry, at the end, end of chapter 26 of Isaiah let's go back to Isaiah when you come to the end of this chapter you see that now we have all kinds of things happening where it is, thy dead men thy dead men are those who were the prisoners and were made alive by the blood of the covenant that they are the ones who are going to be raised from the dead alright, so that, that's what these people are thy dead men shall live are they the Lord God's dead men I think the RSV the NIV and the Septuagint have got it similarly translated here who is the person saying my dead body or dead bodies shall arise for those who got the AV the word my dead body is bodies in the revised version is that Christ that those who are in the Lord in the sleep of death have in fact been transferred to Jesus this is John chapter 5 have they been transferred to Jesus so that the, the, whereas they were the Lord's dead men they are now his dead men because he's released them by the blood of the covenant or maybe, maybe that's what it is but it now changes it says thy and my dead body shall arise now we all believe this this is, this is resurrection you believe in it, I believe in it we're sure of it but what a marvellous thing awake and sing ye that dwell in dust I uh, I don't have many kind of dreams I haven't got time for them really but um, I did have a, a, a dream I may have mentioned it to one or two of you some time or another but it was just one of those things when suddenly I knew in my mind I was in the kingdom we lived just 20 21 miles away from London and it's just a 20 minute train ride into London and I get off the train there and anything I've got to do in London I do it by walking over quite a distance and I in this dream I'd arrived there and I was walking and I suddenly listened and everybody was singing everybody wherever you looked wherever, wherever you tried to hear they were all singing look ye saints the sight is glorious see the man of sorrows now and then crown him crown him and they were all singing it I thought oh what a, what a joy it will be if London is spared and we don't know whether it will be in the end if it's spared, that people will walk through the streets and sing to, to the Lord Jesus Christ 
and to the Lord God of heaven. And we'll be there. You know, there, there is something about our resurrection from the dead. Even though there is judgment, you know, before we are made immortal, there is something about the resurrection, almost as though when we emerge, we shall sing. Awake and sing. What a wonderful thing, eh? That the song is then carried. I know David loves, loves songs and turns Mark and all, all, our, all our pianists. And thanks for the music that you've rendered to us. But what a, what a lovely, lovely thing that these people who've been silent in the grave are now going to sing. And there's something beautiful about what's happening. You might just like to have a look. Because all the figures here are just like sparkling gems and they're, they're all, as it were, interwoven. They're not all the same ideas that, that, that are going on. Because it now says, for thy dew is as the dew of her. All right, and the earth shall cast out the dead. It happens here as it does at home. It's particularly pretty at home because of, of, uh, our seasons are more marked than yours are, and uh, it, it's beautiful on just that springtime when the fresh grass is, is as green as it can be, and the sun is shining. And you wake up and the lawn is covered with dewdrops. But they're not dewdrops now, because the angle of the morning sun is now transforming them into prismatic glory, every kind of colour. And you stand there, just like this, this is thy dew, is as the dew of, and that word herbs, is light. Matter of fact, it's related to the word Urim. That's what, that's what that word is. So it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a, a, a beautiful figure. In other words, you see, the dewdrops are formed as the night is ending, just at a partic particularly critical time, then, just like the manna that fell in the wilderness, that it came with the dew. The bread came with the dew. So when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, then the dewdrops of all the saints will glisten in his glory. With a beauty indescribable. Or, I'm changing the figure, they're all singing dewdrops. All of them. A beauty quite beyond beyond anything we, we can ever really try to imagine. Though we must, as best we can, as we contemplate this time. Eh? I want to be there. There's no place if I don't want to be there. Because I've got to sow the light. You won't have the light on the morning of the return of Christ when he comes with healing in his beams unless the light is in your heart and in your life now and that's what we've got to radiate wherever we go wherever we go every situation can be transformed by light it's what happens in times of accident have you got a light? and so just when somebody arrives with the light then, then we feel safer in some way or another. But on this occasion, the light will be spontaneous, it will be from God when he brings his saints together. The following verses are, look as though they're special protection of the saints of God, perhaps about this, uh, this very time, those who are still alive. But whichever it is, the Lord is arising to his judgment. And in that day, the saints are going to be saved. So, awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. There is um, a psalm, you might like to see this, it's Psalm 60.
it's a psalm uh, at the time of a particular battle when God, God had delivered Judah or Israel probably as a whole but there is a, a little verse in this psalm which we must read and that is verse 4 thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee that it may be displayed because of the, of the truth so that, that's what it says and that word display it means to lift up as a standard that's what it means because that's what banners were at one time that's what you had in, in the time of battle that's you, you had a standard it might be the personal standard of the officer who was leading his men and that was the thing that you then displayed the men saw the, saw the standard and they would die for it even though all it was was just something flapping in a breeze and they would die for it if you go around the cathedrals in Britain then you'll see suspended from the ceiling in many places lots of these almost threadbare flags that have come from all, all over the British Empire and there they are they are the memories of the dead and of the glory that these people enjoyed enjoy now amongst men you and I have a standard that's what it says here isn't it when you're in the truth you have a personal standard because God has given it to you for one purpose and that is to display it because of the truth now it's, it's no use brethren, sisters, young people there, it is no use God giving you a standard if when you go to work, to college or wherever it is you leave your standard at home he's given it to us that it can be displayed because of the truth we should be men of the standards that's what we should be that, that's what God is expecting of you and of me awake and sing awake, arise and Christ will give thee light you've got to have the banner on display that's what, what will set Durban and light by the brethren and sisters of this place that we're not known because of the business we do or, or how we look or by our talk but because we display the banner that people will say these are the people now that's what we've got to be brethren and sisters all of us here that's what we've got to be like we must be in our own place as best we are able get the standard God's given it to you it will never wear out and you'll finally march with it into the kingdom of God you see you probably and everybody's seen photographs of Buckingham Palace and, and so on when there is some great procession uh, and it just so happens although it's it's just tradition and it's custom that there is a certain, there's a certain skill over the centuries that has been brought to bear on this that it's quite astonishing you know as to what what can happen in the marching of men you know I remember when the gun carriage that carried uh, Princess Diana it, it, the soldiers who pulled, personally pulled the gun carriage walked just over four miles and when they arrived right at the door of Westminster Abbey the first stroke of eleven struck at the precise moment they, 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 they'd had their tradition they'd kept their rank and they kept their trust with the princess and had brought her at the right time it was, it was uncanny that that's how it should be but that's how it was now when in that case it wasn't a long procession because this was a very lonely thing wasn't it just a thing going by and people threw their flowers their kisses tears ran down their cheeks 
but when they have the long processions they form them in Hyde Park alongside Park Lane all right so there is the great procession now it, it is not a procession at the moment it's just just all the parts of the procession are all there ready to go it has been arranged that the front of the procession for example will pass number 10 Downing Street at a certain time in order to do that it has got to leave at a certain time and then as that part of the procession moves down Park Lane, Constitution Hill, Buckingham Palace, the Mall, under the, the, the arch there at the end, and finally into Northumberland Avenue, and then finally to the gates of number 10. That's the procession. Now the interesting thing about that is that when the front of the procession passes number 10 Downing Street or the entrance to Downing Street the other parts of the procession are either on the way or they're still in Hyde Park and they will come in due course now this is what the Lord God has done we have been given our standards to carry it through our lives because of the truth to proclaim it, to make it known and not be ashamed of it. It belongs to God and so do we. And we're not just belonging to Durban or Johannesburg or Peter Maritzburg or wherever it is or Watford. We're in a procession. We're on a pilgrimage. And all our banners are going to be presented in Zion. That's where they're going to be. There are the shields of the house of Abraham and David in that very place. And that's what's going to happen. the front of our procession brethren and sisters has arrived at the throne of God it is the Lord Jesus Christ he was ahead of us you remember when they crossed the Jordan to enter the land the ark went 2,000 cubits ahead of the people and we are 2,000 years later than the time of the Lord Jesus Christ who passed into heaven itself but our part of the procession is still moving the leader has arrived he's waiting for the standards of his people and we all of us have got and this, this is where strength comes isn't it when you see somebody else's banner when people are doing it together witnessing together it, it makes it easy it's a joy and these are for the Lord. He's given us to them. They're on loan from him. They're part of the divine army. That's what they are. And we've got to take them to that. There's no point in having the banner if you don't use it. And there is no point in having the banner if you don't arrive. That's what God wants us to do. He's given us a banner. And the banner over us is love. That's what it is. It's the truth of God made manifest in the, in the love of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ensign. He too had a banner. And the, the frightening thing about it is that the ensign, the word used about Jesus, was the tree on which he was nailed. So he bore his banner to the very end. He was high and lifted up and all kinds of things have sought to assault the citadel of Christ to put out the light of the world again to tear down his banner and though every man on earth should do it the banner will still stand and that banner is now reflected in our banners given to us at baptism and that we take with us through this life so what we've got to do my beloved brethren and sisters as our time comes to an end what we've got to do, all of us, is to resolve. This is what we're going to do. We're going to sow the light. That's what all the seminars are about. This is how marriages are, are kept together. By sowing light. 
They are destroyed by sowing darkness. And may our Sunday school and our youth group be where the light is sown. The whole thing is vibrant because of the love and goodness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they might see the banner and want to march in step with the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us together. So that finally it will be a day like there has never been. There was one day like it when, in fact, all the lame people and the blind and the halt were brought to Jesus and he healed them every one. But this will be different. There were the banners and the shields of the saints. All of them be seen as they converge on the city of God. Until the whole city is now, as it were, besieged by the saints of God. These are, as it were, God's own messengers of light. The ones, the ones who have come to worship the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself. And you can be there. We, we've made this show, haven't we, on Sunday. You can be there. You will be there if you'll carry your banner and hold it aloft and not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart or by what you do so that in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ then you'll be able to rejoice when all the banners from every age from every nation under the sun will be brought to bear on that one place until the whole city is alive with the saints of God praising the King and the Lord God Almighty We part now, brethren and sisters, and we all brought our banners here. That was interesting, wasn't it? We weren't ashamed of them. We came. We brought them. I know one or two of us stayed away to go to the beach or whatever it was. You know how it is. You can't actually do much with a, a banner when you're on the beach, can you? You can't swim with it. You can't surf with it. What we've got to do with our banners is to display them because of the truth. So that in the day of Christ, we will be his banner.